number 10 spot we have the Enviro pigs. Scientists have recently created a new kind of pig. The pig that they created can absorb phosphorus in its body. Why is this important, you may ask? Well, scientists discovered that when pigs poo, I'm I'm classy, really. <laughs> when pigs poo, they release a large amount of phosphorus into Mother Earth, and that makes her extremely unhappy. And so it became important for scientists to figure out a way to reduce this. Well, they did, and the genetically engineered pig they created absorbs most of the phosphorus in its body. I believe that this creation may be the first step in creating a pig army that could be used to take over the world, as pigs have a lot in common with humans. A pig army is definitely terrifying, and I really hope that's not the result of this. Let's move on. In our number 9 spot, we have the zombie dog. This one kind of makes me sick to talk about, but it has to be done. If you're a dog person, maybe cover your ears. In the 1940s, some Soviet scientists were apparently bored. Yep, bored, and decided to take the head off of a dog and put it on another animal's body. With some blood transfusion and oxygen pumped to the brain, their experiment was actually successful as the dog came back to life, and he even tried to lick his own nose. This experiment arguably poses a danger to the world's sanity, as dogs are the best creatures ever, and it's just horrible that this was done. But apparently, the science community has stated that this experiment did show some signs of hope in terms of finding solutions for people who are hemorrhaging blood too rapidly to be saved by conventional means. In our number 8 spot we have featherless chickens. This one is literally terrifying to look at, but also kind of terrifying if people are going to ingest this in the future. This is a new kind of chicken that scientists created that is featherless. It's fewer calories and higher protein. Sounds like every weightlifter's dream. <laughs> But don't get too excited about this because apparently these kinds of chickens are more prone to health conditions and are more likely to have parasites. Lovely. Well, this might be the meat that kills the world then. I hope if they do end up mass producing these kinds of chickens that they put on the label featherless chicken. Then people will have an option if they want to take the risk or not. I'm sure they'll do their best to correct this issue before giving it to humans to eat. But then again, actually I take that back, I don't have that much faith in our food suppliers. <laughs> People get ill all the time from meat and they just do a mass recall and that's it. Anyways, buyer beware. In our number 7 spot we have the new sudden death mosquito. Honorable mention. Okay, so before you go hide under the covers, you know something I want to do like all the time, just know that the name of these mosquitoes, it's not as scary as it sounds. A mosquito was created to be essentially an anti-disease mosquito. As mosquitoes carrying malaria is a massive problem in African countries, scientists wanted to try to combat this issue and create a mosquito that would kill other mosquitoes, which eventually would extinguish the species in a few years. Of course, the major problem would be that it would completely disrupt the entire ecosystem that they are a part of. The mosquitoes help provide food for fish and birds and so many amphibians and insects and also in indirect ways for some animals. So it really just wouldn't be good if they were wiped out. Even though honestly it would it would be nice to not be bitten alive every summer. They love my blood. In our number 6 spot we have the spider silk goat. Okay, the idea of a spider goat existing is probably the most terrifying thing to imagine, and if such a thing did exist that had half spider features and half goat features, I would probably cry. However, in the case of this experiment, that isn't exactly what happened. A creature was created that looked like a goat and had so many regular qualities that would make it a goat, but the one difference is that it actually made spider silk protein in its milk, and it could be spun to make spider silk. This is potentially really great for us as spider silk can produce such valuable things such as bandages that are superior and bulletproof armor. But yeah, if they ever create a goat with spider features, I think the world would be in extreme danger. At least our ability to stay sane would be at risk for sure. In our number 5 spot we have the human pig. Ah, the human pig. Yeah, I bet some of you haven't heard of this one, and I mean, it doesn't exist anymore, but it did for 28 days before scientists shut down the experiment, so 
Yeah. An experiment was done to create a human animal hybrid by injecting human stem cells into a female pig. As I said, it was for 28 days, but that's one third of a pig's pregnancy, so the fetus was sufficiently developed before it all got shut down. They were not ready or prepared to deal with the unpredictable outcome if the human animal went to term, and they just kept it alive enough to understand how the cells interact with each other. Can you imagine a pig with a human brain? alive and roaming free in this world? Uh, no, 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 I can't. <laughs> that would definitely be so dangerous, especially if it had pig instincts. Some pigs eat their babies. Enough said. In our number four spot, we have the glowfish. Glowfish are not necessarily a danger to us human beings, but most likely a danger to themselves. Let me explain. The glowfish are fish that have been created as a result of gene splicing, and yes, they glow in the dark. Pretty awesome. However, not so much for them. Why? Well, if they're released into the wild, then they will be extremely vulnerable as predators will be able to easily spot them because, well, they glow and they will be gobbled up easily. Even though there are already fish out there that naturally glow, so they already have to deal with this problem, what is the point of creating a new fish that will also be gobbled up? I don't know, I don't know. <laughs> In our number three spot, we have Rupee. Rupee is a genetically engineered clone dog that is extremely cute. So cute. The world's first cloned beagle, to be exact. He's one of five beagles that were produced by a Korean scientist by the name of Byung Chung Lee. He was cloned by using a viral transfection of fibroblast cells with a protein that allows him to glow red in the dark. Yes, like the devil, because they are demon dogs. Okay, okay, fine. <laughs> this cloned species doesn't seem to threaten the world, but it will threaten all of those out there that get bothered by fluorescent light. Uh, 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 uh. Okay, this was just a scientifically created species that I wanted to give an honorable mention to because they are so cute. But seriously though, this is a big step forward for scientists working to cure human diseases as these dogs are the first modified genes cloned successfully. So really this creation could be the beginning of curing the world instead of endangering it. In our number two spot, we have fast growing salmon. Scientists at Aqua Bounty created a genetically modified salmon that grows extremely fast. This new kind of salmon has the same odor, color, texture, and flavor of standard salmon, but it is able to grow twice as fast because of a growth hormone that stays activated throughout the entire year. But some believe that this could be dangerous to eat, and as of yet, we are unsure as to how safe it is. The FDA have not approved this kind of salmon just quite yet, so perhaps it's better to stay clear until the green light is given. Could be dangerous to the in our number one spot, we have the landmine detecting plant species. Yes, you heard me correctly. Scientists have genetically engineered a plant that can help us detect where landmines are in the world. You might not realize how big of a problem this is, but it is estimated that about 70 people die per day because of unknown landmines that were placed in different areas around the world during the previous wars. I actually know someone personally whose brother died because of a landmine explosion which is pretty insane. So the fact that a group of scientists have created a plant that could help detect them is so awesome. When it's near nitrogen dioxide, an ingredient known in explosives, the plant turns red. That will show us where the landmines are so that they can be removed more safely or even just avoided. The landmines are a danger to the world and this plant could actually be life-saving. So this spot might be the reverse of the title of this video, but this kick-ass new plant species needed an honorable mention. Number 10. Monkey head transplant. Okay, right off the top, here we go. Pun intended. The first ever successful monkey head transplant was back in the early 1970s. I imagine some of your parents may have heard about this. It's probably pretty hard to forget. Maybe ask them about it tonight while they're mid bite at dinner. American researcher Robert White pulled off the otherwise impossible in a slow, tedious operation. White took the head of one monkey and then attached it to a headless monkey. Yeah, add a little time and energy.
energy and voila, this actually worked. Yeah, believe it or not, the monkey actually tried to bite one of the surgeons once it came to, which, I mean, totally fair. I'd be a little pissed off too if I just had a different body all of a sudden. Sadly, the monkey passed away nine days later, which is much further than I ever thought. But the fact that this actually happened is one, terrifying, and two, dare I say, miraculous. This is some sci-fi stuff right here. And here you go, new head, enjoy. Number nine, monkey become human. Okay, this next test here is a little less hands-on. So if you have some food, you could probably take a bite during this one. It's safe. Back in 1931, psychologist Winthrop Kellogg, familiar name, he was curious. Yeah, he sat up one night out of the blue and thought, hmm, what would happen if a monkey was raised with humans? Yeah, would it end up like that monkey from MVP, Most Valuable Primate, would it learn to play hockey for the local team? Or would it learn how to do kickflips with Tony Hawk? No, none of that shit happened. Surprise, surprise. Kellogg brought a baby female chimp named Gua into his home, and this man raised a chimp as if it were another human being alongside his own son, human son, Donald. Yeah, they played, they laughed, they did everything together. But the test ended abruptly after Kellogg's son, Donald, started to make chimp noises. Yeah, and then everyone was like, you know what? I'm good, let's cancel this. Maybe chimps can't learn how to heel flip. We're done, let's go home. So Gua was then Released. There we go. No more human best friend, you know? Back to normal, dare I say, normal? Number eight, feel the music. Okay, this next one here is a little fun, and we're on a part three, and I have to talk about it. I just have to talk about it. There are many odd experiments in history where humans should have left, you know, human elements out, like music and illicit substances. I can't say what I want to say, but it's white, it's fluffy. It's a bad substance that's white and fluffy. There you go, that's all I'll say. YouTube's like, oh, what is he saying? I can't figure it out. There you go, only, only you and I know. We're too smart for the algorithm. Well, back in 2011, a study was done where rats, just a bunch of rats, were all put in a room and on loop, they played a Miles Davis song. So they're all on said illicit substance, right? That stuff. And they were in a room while Miles Davis played all, all day long. Just smooth jazz all day. I'm not laughing because like it's funny. I'm just, it's the weirdest thing. Imagine walking into this room by accident. You're like, what's going on in here? Oh my God, everyone's all hopped up. Well, before the substances were injected into the test subjects, they all seemed to have calm demeanors while Beethoven played on loop. But after injected, all the rats were neurologically triggered to that smooth, smooth jazz. Yeah, after one week on the sauce, the rats were all of a sudden like, you know what? Miles Davis. Kind of slaps. Been sleeping on Miles Davis this whole time. They're all like, yeah, Miles Davis, really good, so good. Horrible animal research and taxpayers' money. Yeah, we love dark history here on Most Amazing Top 10. Number seven, the first pregnancy test. If you're looking past the ancient Egyptian times and their use of barley and urine to determine if somebody is pregnant, you'll often land on this experiment from the 1930s. Now, it was developed in 1931 by Dr. Maurice Friedman at the University of Pennsylvania Medical School. Now, what would happen is doctors would inject they would inject a rabbit with urine from a woman who was suspected of being pregnant. And the rabbit's ovaries could easily tell if that was the case. Accurate test? Yeah. Historical? Of course, it changed the game. Would it also end up with the rabbits passing away? Sadly, also a third yes. It's sad, but more often than not, when humans are involved with any medical process, the test subject dies. You know, before having its head transferred to another animal or something, you're like, what the f is happening here? Number six, small brain and big brain. This next one here, I mean, again, we're on a part three. We're getting into some f***ed up stuff. Here we go. In the early 19th century, humans were figuring out a lot of uh, firsts, you know, especially German researcher Carl August Weinhold. He was on the quest to prove to all that the brain and its nervous system were both attached by wires. Yeah, in order to do so, he took brains and spinal cords of deceased cats and he filled the cavities inside with zinc and silver batteries. And like we know now, the obvious happened. The bodies began to reanimate as if they were alive again. Huh, it's like it's black magic. Or batteries, probably batteries. It's definitely the batteries. This was the first time this type of test was done and now we use electricity and silver for other ways, of course. But thanks to this curious doctor, the early 19th century saw some early Bill Nye the Gross Science Guy stuff. Again, Imagine walking into this room by accident. Like, oh, ho, what's going on in here now? Number five, the multi-dog. Ah, nice. I love dogs. Let's get a bunch for the price of none. Back in the 50s, when a Soviet scientist, Vladimir Demikov, created a multi-dog, Time Magazine had to cover it.
culprit. Of course, this is a feat in science. As cruel as it sounds, of course, the adult dog had a newborn grafted to its neck. It's impressive, but also you're like, ew, my God, Jesus. So when it grew, it could survive off the blood of the main bigger dog. The body, for lack of a better term, gross. When observed, the puppy did have its own characteristics, which was the craziest point here. Some say it was playful with its growls, just as the other dog's characteristics would be. It's a sad 1950 Soviet animal experiment, so of course the animal didn't survive for a long time. It just, you know, all of a sudden it was on something's neck and then it was in the next life. That's horrible. Number four, the Great Razor Auk. Once thriving in colonies off North Atlantic coast, the Great Auk would grow to 30 inches long and its wings would only be used to swim. They were little cute tiny boys. They were cute, but quite defenseless, obviously, since they're not here anymore. Around the 1500s, European fishermen discovered this perfect area for hunting. And it just happened to be where most of these great auks were all living. Yeah, Newfoundland, go get screeched in and then Take out a thousand ox. There we go. It was packed, so they rapidly declined. And by 1950, the last two known specimens were hunted by a single fisherman on LD Island. What a But now, scientists plan on using genetic information extracted from their fossils or preserved organs. You know, people, how they have, you know, birds and jars and stuff like that. They plan on editing their DNA into the closest living species, which is now the razor build auk. So yeah, the organization Revive and Restore may bring these birds back to life, so. Cute Flappy Wings may just return. Remember that game Flappy Wings? Disappeared from the app store so quick. Disappeared faster than number three, the dodo bird. Dodo birds were once big and beautiful. These flightless ground nesting birds once filled islands all over the Indian Ocean. They had massive talons, they were gray and blue. They didn't have any natural predator until, you know, we came along. Sorry, we got hungry. Around 1507, the island was discovered by Portuguese sailors and the rest is history. They were the easiest bird to hunt, hence the phrase, dead as a dodo. That's where it comes from. They weren't just loved by sailors either. No, monkeys, rats, pigs, any animal that made its way to the island easily had their eggs for lunch. And reminder, they were big eggs. So it didn't take a long time for the dodo bird population to be completely wiped out. The last dodo was hunted in 1681. Again, imagine being that guy, what a dick. But could it be? Could we bring the dodo back to life with science? Yes, apparently, this could be a real thing. Scientists found an extremely well-preserved dodo skeleton back in 2007, so we may have a chance at picking some DNA apart. A research facility near Melbourne, Australia is currently trying to use pigeon genes and we're gonna see them in the sky. I mean, I'm all for the idea of bringing back, you know, animals and stuff. Scientifically, that's a wonderful feat, but do we really think no one's gonna make dodo bird chicken wings? I'm gonna get that on Uber Eats in a year. I can just smell it. Number two, the gastric brooding frog. Crossbreeding and gastric brooding. Nice, we're getting close to the end, it seems. I'm a big fan of frogs and the gastric brooding frog is particularly interesting to me and also scientists due to their birthing process. If you're eating something, now would be a good time to you know, hit that thumbs up, maybe take a break, put that food to the side for a bit. See, these frogs back, you know, and when they were alive, they would swallow their eggs and then they would hatch them later out of their mouths. Pretty, pretty horrible if you watch that in time lapse, I bet. They're fascinating creatures. And with the Lazarus Project, scientists are actually trying to bring back the Australian gastric brooding frog from extinction. So we might see this horrible act in person. You might go to catch a frog and then all of a sudden I'd be like, Wah! and there's a baby will come out of it and you'll be like, all right, I'm all set actually, how about that? They went extinct back in 1983, but scientists Scientists have figured out how to implant dead cells into a fresh egg from an entirely different frog species. Amphibians are declining worldwide, so if we can get these guys back out of extinction, it'd be one point for Gryffindor. We'd be looking a lot better, that's all I'm saying. And finally, number one, Martha. Look, I like to keep it light, so I have to end with my girl, Martha. The passenger pigeon once flocked over the skies of Canada. This was the 19th century, and it looked a lot different. Billions of these bright orange birds would just paint the skies, and rumor has it, they would fly in flocks so large that it would block the sun out for a short amount of time. Wow. Hashtag flocks that block. We love it. But only a few decades passed and the passenger pigeon, just, just, they're, they're gone. Just like that. They're no more. So what exactly happened? Well, the very last passenger pigeon, her name was Martha. She sadly passed away in the Cincinnati Zoo in 1914. So we took a look at her DNA to see if Martha held any secrets to her past and their extinction. And we found a couple. They discovered Martha had a low genetic diversity for such a growing population. Natural selection and hunting eliminated the nicest looking pigeon, arguably. The last one died in 1914, but in 2019, paleontologists found remains of the pigeon in protected indigenous lands in the Northwest Territories. So now they blended passenger pigeon DNA with dinosaur DNA, so that's always exciting. We've seen a few movies on how that can go wrong. We're bringing back pigeons with a touch of dinosaur. I'll say it again, on one hand, I'm glad science is allowing us to, you know, try again have another go. But look at the pigeons we have now. Those pigeons are hardcore. These things will walk onto the subway with you. Pigeons today will ask you for change. They're ruthless. They're covered in mustard. It's not the same. These graceful birds from the 
1910s, I feel like we're bringing back Captain America, you know what I mean? I don't think these old school chaps will appreciate the new game of pigeons. They're a little dirty, I don't know. I don't think they're ready, and I don't think we are either. Number 10, the chimpanzee human, also referred to as human Zs which is fun to say. Look, here are the facts, people. We are very close to chimpanzees, DNA-wise. Around 98% of our DNA is shared with these hairy fellows. Back in the 1920s, we got closer than ever. A human Z was not just a fantasy. Soviet biologist Ilya Avanov inseminated female chimps with human DNA, but it didn't work, or did it? Things got questionable when a chimp named Oliver hit the scene in the 70s. Yeah, he was walking like a human, which we've never really seen before. He was referred to as the missing link because of his appearance and the way you would act. He was previously a performance animal, he was a show chimp, so not a hybrid, but many viewed these experiments as immoral back in the day. Which is, yeah, I agree. Also, I remember seeing chimps in family movies, I'm pretty sure. Remember those movies growing up where chimpanzees were like snowboarding or playing hockey? Most extreme primate, that was it. That's where we're at, chimpanzees doing barrel rolls and hockey stops. My friends, we're already there. I think we're already at the Planet of the Apes terrifying point. We're screwed if one of these experiments works, that's all I'm saying. Number nine, human cow eggs. Okay, we had a few giggles talking about chimps. Time to get into the real scary science. Back in 2008, hybrid research was being done. Human animal hybrid research, obviously. The whole idea was to find a cure for Parkinson's disease. I like these projects because we're moving forward, at least. We're not just doing it because we're like, eh, let's see if we can bring dinosaurs back. We're trying to find a solution. Otherwise, we don't need to be poking around cows. Nobody needs three bowls of cereal before gym class, okay? There's other ways to wake up in the morning. Let's just leave cows alone for like a bit, maybe? Scientists used the nucleus of a cow egg. They took it out and replaced that nucleus with the human and skin cells. And then in a little time, the egg can develop and turn into a blastocyst, aka a cloned embryo. And there we have stem cells for said science. Again, this is a lovely step, but how far do we go here with DNA mixing? How much DNA are we gonna mix before we're like, stop? Things could go south. For example, just like the number eight. Kunga. Perhaps the earliest example of human-animal hybrid testing. Scientists recently learned about this donkey hybrid that roamed ancient Mesopotamia. This was a time even before horses arrived, so they had to do something. Large Kungas would pull wagons, and smaller ones would help pulling plows and smaller loads. These little guys were the talk of the town. Imagine a hybrid animal before horses. No wonder they were a status symbol back then. 4,000 years ago, they were given as gifts for weddings. Nice, yummy. Oh, I wonder what this one is. <laughs> It's, it's definitely a kunga. It's gotta be a kunga. After so long, scientists are finally able to figure out what exactly a kunga was a hybrid of. It was a female donkey and a male Syrian wild ass. Yeah, it's crazy what you can still learn from ancient animal bones from thousands of years ago. Science is incredible. It's more amazing how involved this hybrid was in Mesopotamian culture. Do we bring back the kunga? I don't know. Kind of seems like we could use them. Number seven, woolly mammoth. It was announced less than a year ago that a team of scientists and entrepreneurs over at a new biosciences and genetics company called Colossal, they got the funding finally for quite this project. They're planning to bring the woolly mammoth back to life. Yep. Instead of just paying off student loans, they're like, how about we bring a mammoth back? Let's just see if we can do that. That'll solve some problems. The last mammoth alive was around 7,500 years ago. But what if we had these hairy goliaths back again today? The Siberian tundra thousands of years ago was once full of these guys, but climate change began to slow them down. Also, humans needing food definitely didn't help. These guys provided warmth and... Well, obviously, look at them. Lots of food, so they died off quite quick. Genetics company Colossal raised over $15 million to try and bring this thing back to life. And they're on the way, they're, they're doing it right now. That's happening as we speak. A mammoth is being born. They're using the CRISPR gene editing tool, which is a fun tool, I guess. Elephants are still kicking around and their genomes, combined with the preserved mammoth DNA, is the magic trick. So if you see mammoths trending on Twitter in four to six years, well, you know why. There's not another Ice Age movie. It's definitely just a real mammoth. Number six, Pyrenean ibex. The Pyrenean ibex also went extinct a long time ago. This was much sooner though than mammoths. This was around 2000. The last one was a female named Celia and a falling tree sadly ended her life. Of all the ways to go, really? Come on, man, that's sad. It was a subspecies of the Spanish ibex. They were native to the Pyrenees Mountains on the border of Spain and France. Back in the medieval ages, their population was reduced drastically to an endangered level because of, you know, knights and swords and bows equals lunch, right? So the numbers dipped. More than fair, this army's to feed, but in 2009, science was ready for the Pyrenean ibex to return. It was successfully cloned and brought back from extinction for seven whole minutes. Yeah, seven minutes in heaven, or seven minutes out of heaven, rather. DNA from the last living lady was implanted in the womb of a domestic goat. 
Yeah, a little goat, a little goat hybrid. Lung complications are why the clone sadly didn't last, but we had a hybrid medieval animal for seven minutes. We're getting close. Number five, the super cow. Moo, but with a lot of O's. Introducing the super cow. Okay, start your day off with some super milk, and then have a super stomach ache. <laughs> your super pants. My god, I can't do milk anymore. Only in Belgium. Back in the 1800s, scientists and farmers brought together native cattle and short horn cattles to make this hybrid animal. After that, they would literally just pick the biggest cows of the bunch and then have them breed together, and then so on and so forth. These cows are officially called Belgian blues, but I will continue to call them super cows. Thank you very much. That sounds amazing. I can't even look at them. God, they're disturbing. They look like bodybuilders. Just, it makes no sense. How does, what? Where does that come from? Let's move on. Number four, Tasmanian tiger. Once native to Australia, the Tasmanian tiger, also known as the thylakine, was a massive carnivorous marsupial that went extinct around the 1930s, also quite recently. Major factors here are as, you know, you guessed what I said earlier, climate change, hunting, and its genetic diversity wasn't all too great. All those combined, it's just no chance. It's sad on one hand because these beautiful creatures disappeared so recently, but it's also recent enough that we have a shot of bringing them back to life. Hey, what's up? Hey, you've been asleep, hi. Hybrid science. There we go. Let's get mixing. Yeah, imagine looking outside and seeing this thing on your front yard. Are we ready for this? I think we're ready. Let's jazz up some trails by introducing these guys. Specimens of the Tasmanian tiger still remain preserved in jars. No idea who has them or why, but we'll move on from that. Thank God for those jars. So we have Tasmanian tiger genes present, so scientists can now insert them into a mouse fetus. They just combine fetus of a mouse in DNA. I, I do this a lot, this is how I explain, I'm gonna explain this to my kids and be like, hey, this is how, how, how the human life cycle works. You just do this with your hands a lot and then you're alive. They're still lacking the full DNA to successfully recreate it, but they're close. A recent $5 million donation to the University of Melbourne earlier this year allowed for researchers to create a research lab. So yep, they're actually getting very close. They're like making the lab to make this thing. I'm like, ooh, they're gonna do it. Number three, the Great Razor Auk. Ah uh, yes, once thriving in colonies off North Atlantic coasts, the Great Auk would grow up to 30 inches long and its wings would only be used to swim. They were cute, but quite defenseless, these little guys. Around the 1500s, European fishermen discovered this perfect area for hunting and or eating, and it just happened to be where most of these great ox were hanging out, so they disappeared fast. By 1950, the last two known specimens were hunted by a single fisherman on Elde Island, just off the coast of Iceland. And that was it. They were gone. Until now. Nice. Scientists plan on using genetic information extracted from their fossils, or preserved organs. Remember those guys in jars and the organs that I talked about? Yep. Classic organs in jars. Always coming in handy. They plan on editing their DNA into the closest living species, which is now the razor-billed ox. So now we get a Nice fun hybrid again. The organization Revive and Restore is behind the wheel on this one, so keep it up. Keep bringing things back from extinction. Just not humans, I don't want zombies, please. Number two, lions. Back in the 80s in the Chatbir Zoo in India, they started an experimental program where they would breed together domestic lions and African lions in the hopes that they would just be introduced to the wild and help with the dwindling population of wild lions in India. On paper, that's, yeah, that's a great idea. That's a step forward, we love those. But the zoo found two African lions that were being used in a circus and was like, you know what? We're gonna save you guys, get out of the circus. Then they brought them in to breed with their two Asiatic lions, so. I mean, from circus to science, it's like, yeah, you're still sorry. When the cubs were born, it was clear this was already a mistake from the get-go. The cubs already had severely weak back legs, they were having trouble walking as they got older, their immune system started to fail, and by 2000, they had bred more than 70 of these hybrid lions. So they finally decided to stop the program and all the males were given vasectomies in order to stop any further reproduction. There were luckily laws that prohibited them from killing these animals, so at this point, we're just waiting for them to die naturally, which sucks, but it's definitely better. And finally, Number one, the dodo bird. Dodo birds were once big and beautiful. These flightless ground nesting birds once filled the islands of Mauritius located in the Indian Ocean. They were awesome. We've seen them in ice ages. They're all funny and big and furry. They had massive talons. They were gray and blue. They were gorgeous. And best part of all, they didn't have any natural predator until, you know, us, we, until we came around. Around 1507, the island was discovered by Portuguese sailors, and well, the rest is history, and or lunch. They were the easiest bird to hunt, hence the phrase dead as a dodo. They weren't just loved by sailors either, they were not 100% to blame here. Monkeys, rats, pigs, any animal basically that made its way to the island easily had their eggs for lunch, so it didn't take long for the dodo bird population to be completely wiped out. The last dodo was hunted in 1681, but could it be? 
Could we bring back said dodo birds? Scientists found an extremely well preserved dodo skeleton back in 2007, so we may have a chance at picking some DNA apart there and bringing them back to life via hybrid science. A research facility near Melbourne, Australia is currently trying to use pigeon genes to bring the bird back. I mean, yeah, I'm all for the idea of bringing an animal back to life. Scientifically, that's definitely a feat in itself, but how long before these things are on hot ones, you know? Like dodo chicken wings? Now that I've said it, you kind of want one, right? Now you feel bad. There we go, hit that thumbs up so we don't feel guilty in the future. Starting our list off at number 10, the turkey fake out. Okay, this one is pretty hilarious. I have to start off our list here, especially in a dark list about crossbreeding, come on. Back in the 60s, turkey biologists in Pennsylvania thought, you know what, what if a male turkey was in a room with a fake turkey? Yeah, a fake female turkey. Would he try and flirt with it? Would he, I am legend, this fake turkey? What would happen? Well, the answer is yes, these male turkeys would try and mate with a fake turkey, which is funny, but by the end of the test, they were really surprised more than anything. They would just have the head of a turkey on a stick and these dudes still came out like, hey, what's going on, you single, what's up? What's happening? It didn't matter. It was just the head and the rest didn't matter. The sticks chicks over here are catching every turkey's attention. But why? Why don't they care about the body? What's going on? Like biologically, this makes no sense. The scientific conclusion here, yes, there was one, was that the turkey fixates on the head when it comes to finding a mating partner, which is honestly pretty sweet. They're holding eye contact the whole time, even with their bobby weird heads. They're still like, hey, it's just you and me. Let's talk. Number nine, the gastric brooding frog. Okay, now we're back. Now, immediately back to business. Crossbreeding and gastric brooding. Okay, we're getting scientific now. I'm a big fan of frogs, except for when they hatch eggs out of their back. We don't like those. Our editors also don't like those clips either. I found out the hard way. I'm like, yeah, insert clip of a frog coming out of other frogs back from 129. They're like, please God, no. So, bless your soul. Give the thumbs up for our editors today. Thumbs up for all of our editors today. We give them horrible, horrible links they have to put together and make into art. These frogs, not so bad. These frogs would swallow their eggs and they would hatch them out of their mouth. Honestly, they're fascinating creatures. And with the recent Lazarus Project, scientists are trying to bring the Australian gastric brooding frog back from extinction. So we can see, we can see all that again in person. We can see them, honestly, I think the back stuff's better now that I think about it. A frog coming out of a mouth, ooh. It went extinct back in 1983, but scientists have now figured out how to implant dead cells into a fresh egg from an entirely different frog species. Yeah, just zombie frogs, I guess. Zombie frogs that give birth through their mouths. Do we know what we're doing here? Sounds weird when you say it out loud. Uh, bu, bu, bu. Amphibians are declining worldwide, so if we can get these guys out of extinction, we're looking good. We're looking better, rather. Number eight, Martha. Look, I like to keep it light, so I have to include my girl Martha on this list. The passenger pigeon, she once flocked over the skies of Canada. This was back in the 19th century. Billions of these bright orange pigeons would paint the skies, and rumor has it, they would fly in flocks so large that it would block out the sun for a short amount of time. Beautiful, could you imagine? Flocks that block, we love it. But only a few decades passed and passenger pigeons are now no more. They're entirely extinct, sad stuff. The very last passenger pigeon, her name was Martha. She passed away in the Cincinnati Zoo back in 1914. So we took a look at her DNA to see if Martha held any secrets to their extinction and we found a key. Possibly, we could bring Martha back. I don't know why I did that, it's pretty dark. Like a little bird, <laughs> wouldn't work at all. They discovered Martha had a low genetic diversity for such a growing population. Natural selection and hunting eliminated arguably the nicest looking pigeon. The last one died in 1914, but in 2019, paleontologists found remains of the pigeon in protected indigenous lands in the Northwest Territories. So now we have hope, right there. They blended passenger pigeon DNA with Archaeoteryx dinosaur DNA. Yeah, we're bringing back pigeons with a touch of dinosaur. I'll say it again, on one hand, yeah, that's, that's great. I'm glad science is allowing us to try again, but look at the pigeons we have now. What's gonna happen to these guys? They're hardcore. Pigeons now will walk onto the subway. They'll ask you what time it is. They don't care. These graceful birds from the 1910s, I don't think they're ready. That's like a back to the future. That's like hot tub time machine type. I'm like, uh, you guys won't get along. Number seven, woolly rhinoceros. Since I mentioned the revival of woolly mammoths in part one, what better time to mention this hairy beast? The woolly rhino, okay. I oddly want to pet him, weirdly. Once upon a time, these rhinos were common throughout Europe and Asia. They were all prepared for the cold tundra, hence the fur, the thick blanket of fur. Just like the woolly mammoth, right? They adapt to survive. So no ice age will stop this rhino. Ideally, that was the 
That was the plan. I mean, it didn't help them out entirely, but it was mostly humans needing food and warmth that led to their extinction. So cut to 14,000 years later, we're trying to apologize. We're trying to make it up to them by bringing them back to life. It's a little hotter now, good luck. The same company responsible for the Mammoth Project is also trying to bring back this hairy boy. I mean, yeah, again, I'm all for science, but if these species died out that long ago, will highways help them? Imagine running into one of these. Number six, Megatherium. We talked about bringing back woolly rhinos and woolly mammoths, so what other Ice Age cast members can we potentially see on the highway? Perhaps the Megatherium, AKA the giant sloth? I, why are we doing this? What if this works? We don't want to see this. Sloths used to be a lot bigger than we think, folks. We often laugh at them for being slow and stuff. The movie Ice Age, sure, it didn't help their case. But we learned, we learned stuff. Like the dodo bird, we're bringing them back. Sloths, we're also bringing them back. Of course, the giant ground sloth is closely related to our modern three-toed sloth. But luckily for us, today's sloths aren't the size of an elephant. That would be a horror film if we brought these back. Like, let's just leave normal sloths. We may be able to bring this one back, although they died off thousands of years ago due to DNA samples. Yeah, we got some DNA samples extracted from their hair remains, so the next step now that's waiting for us is to develop a fetus in an artificial womb. That's the hard part, but we're very close. Too close, I'd say. Stop. If you're working on any, you know, Megatherium science projects, just, you know, chill. Just chill out for a bit. Number five, spider art. For a nice halfway point here, I have to mention NASA's 1995 spider test, which sounds really scary, but it's not that bad, hear me out. When nature meets science, we often get jarring results, be it hybrid animals, clones, you name it. Spiders, as fascinating as they already are, can be even more mysterious, especially when they're exposed to mind-altering illicit substances. Yeah, just some hardcore stuff. NASA wanted to determine the toxicity between said substances and what differences they may look like. Spiders are fascinating. We can literally see how they think and survive. We see it up close when we walk through them and go, oh, ew, ew, gross, but we never see them like this, right? Caffeinated behavior is all over the place. It doesn't look like a normal spider at all, but with hallucinogens, it's the same shape, but it's almost missing steps, right? Little differences between all these tests. I don't think any animal should have coffee, period. I don't think an espresso goes well with any bug. Yeah, trust, trust me. I'm all jacked up on coffee right now. The moa. This New Zealand bird went extinct about 600 years ago, and I'm pretty glad. They're absolutely terrifying. They were flightless birds, uh, massive, hence the flightlessness, and archaeologists first discovered a fossil in a cave. Its flesh and everything was still attached. It looked something out of a horror movie. It was terrible. These ancient birds would reach around five or six feet tall, and when you think of dinosaurs, you probably think, oh, that's, that's quite petite. No, this is horrible. The birds stopped flying right after these dinosaurs went extinct. According to biologist Matthew Phillips from the Australian National University in Canberra, these birds safely roamed the land after they didn't need to make, you know, daring dinoscapes. So they got fat, they walked around, they stopped flying, and they just retired. Then they would hang out in caves and just eat good. Phillips says this is an advantage when it came to birds and evolution because wings, big or small, kill energy. So it might seem a little depressing to watch a creature, yeah, lose the ability to fly, but it's because they're eating better, right? Eh, I would rather eat really well than fly, to be honest. I can't even fly now, and I'm like, eh, I'd still rather just eat a lot. Again, why are we mixing DNA of a dinosaur with new birds? This is where we turn into Jurassic Park. Any minute. Next year, I'll be like, hey, top 10 animals that made the test and now we're screwed. Number three, the Stellar Sea Cow. Stellar indeed, yeah, the Stellar Sea Cow was named after George Wilhelm Stellar, who discovered this massive creature back in the mid 1700s during the Vitus Bering's Great Northern Expedition. They found her right after the crew became shipwrecked. What a lovely little surprise to an otherwise horrible situation. They were all over the place two million years ago. They were no match for humans at all. They only swam around a meter deep, and once humans came into the picture much later, they were very easy to hunt. They were fat little blubber balls just that would sit in shallow water. I mean, come on, you just... George Steller commented that the animals had an uncommon love for their families, which made it even easier to hunt. Considering the one year gestation period, the species couldn't reproduce fast enough to keep up with our hunting. But with this list, we have a little hope, right? That's why I'm here. Hi, now you're sad. I'm here to make your day a little happier. Scientists were able to sequence the genome, which means that we may see these creatures very soon, one day. Hopefully soon. The answer may lie in the DNA of a dugong. Yeah, dugongs are the cow of the sea, so what better relative to kind of pick apart and maybe crossbreed. Number two, the mouse with an ear on its back. And we're right back to horrible stuff, okay. If we ever reboot Stuart Little, this guy 
needs to audition. He's killing it. The mouse with a human ear, folks. This is like the world's greatest mouse spy. This is horrible. What are we looking at here? Why did someone do this? Well, back in 1997, this mouse became the test subject to determine if scientists could grow cartilage using chondrocytes, aka cells from a cow. Well, it worked, and we're still talking about it, obviously, because it's the weirdest thing I've ever looked at. Yeah, Joseph began designing human organs, and this was during a shortage where human organs wasn't just like, you know, common, easy thing to get. He wasn't just bored and, you know, started making ears. He was, he was changing the medical game, okay? And little did he know he was about to change the science game as well. He constructed an ear, a fake ear, then told his brother Chuck and his partner Bob not to bring up the fact that he attached said ear to a mouse. But Chuck, obviously, because of what happened, he, he spilled the beans, he told a few friends. But now, we all know how cow cartilage can create cells, so little secret became great science. I really want to Q-tip his back. Is that weird? I want to Q-tip the mouse with an ear on its back. Ear. Back. And finally, number one, the multi-dog. Okay, crossbreeding experiments from hell. Let's finish on a really messed up one. The multi-dog. This was back in the 50s when a Soviet scientist, Vladimir Demikov, created a well, a multi-headed dog. Time Magazine covered it, of course. This is a feat in science. As cruel as it is, of course, this was a big deal. The adult dog had a newborn pup grafted to its neck. So when it grew, it could survive off the blood of the main bigger dog. The body, for lack of a better term. When observed, the puppy did have its own characteristics. It was playful, it was growling, it would lick people's hand and stuff like that, just as the other dog's characteristics would be in its own unique way. It's a sad 1950s Soviet animal experiment, so of course the animal didn't survive a long time, but crossbreeding experiments from hell, that's, that's why we're here. This is the note that we're gonna end on. Starting off this list in our number 10 spot, we have bees. A lot of us know bees as pretty harmless and are kind of cute little pollinators, unless of course you're allergic or terrified. But truthfully, bees normally do a lot more good than harm. That was, of course, until an experiment in the 1970s went awry and caused a new crossbred bee. This experiment was to take a regular honey bee and breed it with a bee that is found in Africa that produces a lot more honey. And of course, the goal was to produce a manageable bee that would also be able to provide more honey than a regular honey bee. Well, the bees that came out were a lot less manageable and they didn't even make more honey. After this experiment ended, however, the bees got out into the environment and the 80s saw the beginning of the trouble. The bees are not only aggressive towards other kinds of bees, which creates a huge problem, but they are also very aggressive towards humans. And when these bees sting, their stinger stays with them, so they can sting multiple times. Victims of these swarms receive 10 times as many stings as regular swarms. They react to disturbances 10 times faster, and they will also chase the disturbance a quarter of a mile. Imagine. These bees have actually caused at least a thousand deaths, so it's safe to say that this is one experiment gone horribly wrong. In our number 9 spot today, we have lions. In the 1980s, at the Chatbir Zoo in Chandigarh, India, they started an experimental program where they would breed together a domestic lion, which is a bit smaller and has less of a shaggy mane, with an African lion in the hopes that they could be introduced to the wild and help with the dwindling population of wild lions in India. The zoo found two African lions that were being used in a circus and brought them in to breed with their two Asiatic lions. When the cubs were born, it was clear that this was already a mistake as the cubs all had severely weak back legs. They were having extreme trouble walking and as they got older their immune systems started to fail. By 2000 they had bred more than 70 of these hybrid lions and they finally decided to stop the program and all the males were given vasectomies in order to stop any reproduction. There are laws that prohibit them from killing animals so they were simply just waiting for them to die naturally. When there's a dwindling population of lions it's insane to me that they wasted 20 years trying to do this when they could have just simply bred the lions that they did have. In our number 8 spot today, we have the human Z. One of the most contentious and ethically charged endeavors pursued by Ilya Ivanovich Ivanov, an extremely controversial Russian biologist, was his endeavor to produce a hybrid offspring between humans and apes. The goal, actually, was to create a superhuman soldier for military purposes, and as early as 1910, Ivanov presented his concept of achieving such a feat through the means of artificial insemination during the World Congress of Zoologists in Graz, Austria. In the 1920s, Ivanov embarked on a series of experiments aimed at creating a human-ape hybrid in French Guinea. Three female chimpanzees were selected as potential surrogate mothers, and the experiment 
began. However, despite his efforts, Ivanov was unable to achieve a successful pregnancy and bring about the desired hybrid offspring. Thank God. Upon his return to the Soviet Union in 1929, Ivanov sought to organize a new set of experiments involving the use of non-human ape seminal fluid and human volunteers. What human would volunteer for that? I don't know, and I don't want to know. However, these plans were met with setbacks, notably the demise of his last remaining orangutan, which delayed the commencement of the proposed endeavors. Ivanov's pursuit of creating a human ape hybrid was met with considerable controversy and skepticism. Fair enough. The scientific community was divided, with many dismissing his ideas as unfeasible and scientifically dubious. Nevertheless, his experiments reflect a dark chapter in the history of crossbreeding experiments, highlighting the extreme lengths some scientists were willing to go to in the pursuit of scientific knowledge, even if it meant transgressing the boundaries of ethical conduct. In our number 7 spot today, we have the Zonki. Another one of the strange and unsettling experiments from Ivanov involved the creation of hybrid offspring known as Zonkis, or Zebruses, by crossing female zebras with donkeys. This experiment aimed to explore the possibilities of interbreeding between closely related species and were conducted during the early 20th century. The goal was to create a hybrid offspring that would exhibit a mix of characteristics from both zebra and donkey parents. These experiments were actually somewhat successful, leading to the birth of several zonkeys. The resulting zonkeys possessed traits from both species, with physical characteristics resembling a combination of zebras and donkeys. They often displayed striped markings on their bodies, similar to those found on zebras of course, and zonkeys typically retained the zebra's body shape as well, while inheriting certain donkey features such as a long ear and tuft tails. It's very cute. While these experiments achieved some success in producing hybrid offspring, they did face ethical concerns and criticism due to the manipulation of animal genetics for experimental purposes. In our number 6 spot today, we have lions, tigers, and ligers. Crossbreeding experiments between lions and tigers have resulted in the creation of hybrid offspring known as ligers and tigans. Ligers are the result of breeding a male lion with a female tiger, while tigons are the offspring of a male tiger and a female lion. However, while these hybrids have been successful in terms of producing viable offspring, they raise significant concerns and have been regarded as ethically problematic. The primary issue with lion-tiger hybrids is related to their health and welfare. Ligers, in particular, often suffer from various health problems. Their large size, resulting from the combination of their parent species, puts a strain on their bodies, leading to skeletal and organ abnormalities. Ligers also have a higher likelihood of experiencing reproductive issues and shortened lifespans compared to their parent species. Additionally, these crossbreeding experiments are typically carried out for entertainment or commercial purposes, aiming to produce exotic and visually striking animals for display. This has raised ethical concerns about the welfare of the animals involved, as such breeding practices often prioritize profit and human fascination over the well-being of the hybrids. Moreover, these hybrid experiments highlight the blurred boundaries between species and the potential negative consequences of manipulating nature for human curiosity and amusement. While ligers and tigons may attract attention due to their very unique appearances, the ethical implications and potential harm to the animals involved have led to widespread criticism of such crossbreeding practices. In our number 5 spot today, we have the farm cattle. In the 1990s, farmers in India were told that if they crossbred their cattle, they'd be able to breed cattle that could produce more milk, which would of course mean more money for them and their families. This should be amazing and great, right? Well, considering why we're all here today, I think we know the answer to that. Different breeds of bulls were brought in and farmers were expecting great things, but they ended up being stuck with cattle that did produce more milk, but also needed way more higher quality food or else they'd stop producing more milk. And they were also less resistant to the local diseases, so they required more veterinary visits as well. So it's kind of like this situation of yes, they are producing more milk, well, which will get us more money, but they also cost us more, and truthfully, most of the times the increased milk production did not outweigh the growing costs. In our number four spot today, we have the Wolfen. Wish I never had to say the word Wolfen, but unfortunately, they do exist. These guys are created when a female common bottlenose dolphin is bred with a male false killer whale. They are extremely rare and have been found in the wild, but unfortunately, most of the ones that have existed were bred in captivity. The first recorded Wolfen was born at the 
Tokyo Sea World in 1981, and he very sadly died just 200 days later. Probably a prime example of why maybe they shouldn't really exist in the first place. The first that was born in the United States that actually miraculously survived was at a sea life park in Hawaii in May of 1985, and her name is Kike Malu. She ended up having three babies. The first passed away after a few days, the second passed away at the age of nine, but thankfully, the third one is still living. The most recent update I could find seems to state that at this point, both mother and her daughter are still alive, but unfortunately, they remain in captivity. In our number three spot today, we have the beefalo. Okay. Beefalo sounds kind of cute and silly, and it also looks pretty normal, so what could be wrong with this one? Well, let's start at the beginning. A guy named Charles Buffalo Jones started breeding them in 1906 because the bison population in Arizona at the time was exceptionally low. So bison were bred with domestic cattle in order to produce a hardy commercial animal. He ended up just giving up on this and released the animals who were then managed by the state, and the numbers remained relatively low because of the limited hunting licenses. Well, when the beefalo found their way into a national park where hunting is banned and there aren't any natural predators, the population began to grow by 50% a year. That's wild. So none of this is necessarily bad, but it's the animal's environmental impact that is the real trouble. First off, they're very thirsty animals and can consume 10 gallons each per trip to a watering hole, so they can obviously clear up a water source pretty quickly. Not to mention the fact that they do their business in the water and how their heavy weight compacts the soil. Basically, they have totally thrown the ecosystem off balance and have pushed out other animals and the insects and plant life around have also been affected. In our number two spot today, we have the Pyrenean Ebex. The Pyrenean Ebex is an animal that went extinct around 2000 in a horrible turn of events. The last one was a female named Celia and she was killed in an awful falling tree incident. These animals were native to the Pyrenees mountains on the border of Spain and France. Back in the medieval ages, their population was reduced drastically to an endangered level. This is due to two things, being hunted as well as the spread of human disease. Flash forward to 2003, however, and scientists tried to bring them back to life. This is the first extinct creature that scientists ever tried to clone. That is absolutely crazy, and it actually worked for seven minutes only. DNA from Celia, the last living individual of the species, was taken and implanted into the womb of a domestic goat. From here, the clone was in fact born but due to lung complications, was unable to survive for longer than seven minutes. It was a short life, but a monumental one that definitely broke new ground in the scientific world. And finally, in our number one spot today, we have the human pig experiment. Back in 2017, researchers at the Salk Institute for Biological Studies achieved a significant milestone by producing the first ever human pig chimera, as reported in the journal Cell. The team used cells from an adult human to create stem cells, which were then injected into early early stage pig embryos. These embryos were implanted into female pigs and allowed to develop for several weeks. Approximately one in every 100,000 cells in the later stage pig embryos was derived from humans. In this human pig experiment, the researchers encountered trial and error in finding human stem cells that developed in alignment with the pig's embryo's timeline. The ultimate goal of such research is to potentially grow human organs within pigs for transplantation, addressing the shortage of donors. Donor organs. While the study raises possibilities for life saving organ transplants, critics argue that mixing human and animal elements crosses ethical boundaries. The National Institutes of Health in the United States has prohibited federal funding for human chimera research, although there have been indications of potential relaxation under careful monitoring. The research opens up opportunities and ethical questions, but fears of creating half human, half animal chimeras are not applicable to the study. The next challenge for the research researchers is to improve efficiency and guide the human cells to form specific organs within the pig hosts. Starting off this list in our number 10 spot, we have the centaur. This is one of the most famous hybrid creatures of all time, the infamous horseman of Greek legends. It isn't quite clear exactly how this legend originated, but there is a really interesting theory which I love. Basically, some people believe that perhaps the idea for this creature came about when the people of the Minoan culture, who are said to have possibly at the time been unfamiliar 
familiar with horses, they ran into a tribe of horse riders. The skill these people had in riding horses, along with how being able to traverse on horse would of course change the way that the Minoan people lived, basically just inspired them to create these tales of the horse-human hybrid creature. This seems like a very possible origin for the legend, but regardless of where it came from, the legend stuck around into Roman times, where it was then highly debated whether or not these creatures actually may exist. Clearly, however, this legend would go on to endure long past the days of ancient Rome, considering the fact that the tales of the centaur still exist today. In our number 9 spot today, we have the Echidna. The Echidna is a half-woman, half-snake creature that first became well-known through Greek mythology. In the legends, she is described as being half-beautiful maiden and half-fearsome snake. In fact, Hesiod described her as an irresistible monster who was like neither mortal men nor the undying gods. Instead, she was, quote, half a nymph with glancing eyes and fair cheeks, and half again a huge snake, great and awful with speckled skin, and she, quote, dies not nor grows old all her days. Echidna is the partner to Typhon, who is a terrifying snake man, and the two are said to have created the most horrendous children. The first child was Orthrus, who was a two-headed dog who guarded the cattle of Geryon. The second child was Cerberus, who was a dog with more than two heads who guarded the gates of Hades. And finally, their third child was the Lernian Hydra, a serpent with many heads who had the ability to regrow any if they were to get cut off. This is all to say that Echidna had quite a terrifying story to her, and it's interesting because some scholars believe that the tales of dragons in medieval Europe were actually based in part on Echidna. In our number 8 spot today, we have the Mandrake. If you're a Harry Potter fan, you might be familiar with mandrakes, and they are particularly interesting because they are one of the few examples that represent a human hybrid that is a mix between human and plant. The mandrake plant is a very real group of plants in the genus Mandragora, and they are usually found in the Mediterranean. It is believed that the tales of the mandrake come from the fact that often, the roots of the mandrake have such a strange appearance, they sort of look like human faces. This likely would have been enough to fuel the legend but things do not end here. The thing is, is that this plant has some hallucinogenic properties, so that, combined with the weird face looking roots, and you have the perfect recipe for quite a legend. It's funny to think that this story probably started out because someone was on a bit of a trip. In the legends, when the plant is dug up from the ground, it will release a horrible scream that has the ability to kill anyone who hears it. In our number 7 spot today, we have the Sphinx. The Sphinx is of course commonly associated with ancient Egypt, and it is the creature that is depicted with the head of a human, the body of a large cat, and the wings of an eagle. Like I said, this image is often associated with ancient Egypt due to the famous monument that can be visited in Giza still today. But this isn't the only place the Sphinx is seen in legends. In Greek tradition, the Sphinx plays the role of a merciless woman who will kill and eat anyone who cannot answer her riddle as seen in the tragedy of Oedipus. When we take it over to Egypt, the Sphinx is often seen with the head of a man and was seen as a benevolent creature with incredible strength. The legends and imagery of the Sphinx have long endured the years since these ancient empires and continue today and have even expanded into different cultures. In our number 6 spot today, we have sirens. These creatures originated from the tales of ancient Greece, and in these stories, sirens were creatures with the head and upper body of a human woman, but with the legs and tails of a bird. These creatures were alluring and exceptionally dangerous, mostly to sailors. The siren would sing a beautiful song from the rocky shores, which were said to hide dangerous reefs below the water. Using her songs, she would lure sailors to this treacherous area, likely to meet their demise. The siren is an important character in the legend of Odysseus as he returned from Troy in the epic. In the legend, he had to tie himself to the mast of his ship in order to resist the temptations and the lure. The tales of the siren have lasted for years and were still quite prevalent when they made a reappearance in the writings of 17th century Jesuit priests who believed that these creatures were in fact real. Today we still use the word siren and the term siren song to describe things or ideas that are exceptionally intriguing and alluring. Through Throughout the years, the descriptions of the siren have gone on to become a bit more mermaid-like than bird-like as they originated, 
Which does bring me to my next point. In our number 5 spot today we have mermaids. Mermaids are one of the most famous creatures in our modern mythology that came all the way from ancient Assyria. These creatures with the upper body of a human and the lower body of a fish, all from the goddess Atargatis who transformed herself into a mermaid after she was ashamed of herself for accidentally killing her partner. A tragic story that spurred the tales of mermaids for centuries to come. Since these legends, mermaids have appeared in stories all over the world and often people regard them as less than fictional. Christopher Columbus swore he saw real mermaids on his voyage to the New World, but then again it's becoming abundantly clear that he had no idea what he was looking at for a lot of that journey. Some places and cultures have slightly varying versions of the mermaid, like the Selkie, which is an Irish and Scottish version of a mermaid who is half seal and half woman. Of course, this creature went on to inspire many famous stories, including the Disney smash hit, The Little Mermaid. In our number four spot today, we have a harpy. Harpies are a character seen in Greek and Roman stories, and in those, they are described as a bird, but with the head of a woman. And at first, I thought that sounds kind of nice and cute, but when we take it back to some of the the earliest mentions of harpy, like by the poet Ovid, we see them described as human vultures, which sounds significantly more terrifying than what I was imagining. In fact, harpies are quite often described as horrifying, disgusting creatures, with descriptions that only get more grim as time goes on. Initially, it seems as though harpies were seen as the personification of storm winds, and throughout the legends we see that they would often steal food from their victims as they were trying to eat, and also, they would be responsible for carrying those who had done evil things to the Arenes were the female deities of vengeance. When a person suddenly disappeared off the earth, it is thought to have been the work of the harpies. They were the agents of punishment who were known to be cruel, vicious, and pretty violent as well. In our number 3 spot today we have the Gorgons. It is possible that you may not be familiar with the term Gorgon, but it is very likely that you know one of them. The descriptions of the Gorgons do vary slightly, but they commonly refer to three sisters. Stheno, Uriel, and Medusa. These sisters were mostly human, except for the fact that their hair was made up of slithering, slimy snakes. The earliest examples of the Gorgons comes from the Greek mythology, in which the Gorgon-like creature had scales and claws but no serpent hair. When the tales of the three sisters came into play, so did the stories of how they had horrifying faces that should anyone gaze upon them, they would immediately be turned into stone. In the legends, two of the sisters are immortal, but the most famous of the trio, Medusa, was not. This led to her being slain by the demigod Perseus, but not so much could be said for the other two. In our number two spot today, we have the Minotaur. This creature was first seen in Greek legends and later Roman, and basically it is a creature that is part bull, part man. The name of this creature comes from the bull god Minos, who was a major deity in ancient times. The Minotaur is said to have been created as Minos competed with his brothers as ruler. During this time, Minos prayed to Poseidon, the sea god, to send him a snow white bull as a sign of the god's favor. Minos was meant to sacrifice the bull in order to honor Poseidon, but he was entranced by the bull's beauty and decided to keep him, thinking that the god would accept a different sacrifice in place of the bull. Of course, Poseidon was not pumped about this decision, so he needed to punish Minos. He did this by making Minos' wife fall in love with the bull, and one thing led to another, and there was some very unnatural offspring. In the end, the Minotaur was born, but there was no natural food source for this creature, so instead it began to devour human flesh to appease its appetite. The creature is depicted as having the head and tail of a bull with the body of a man. While the most famous appearance of the Minotaur was in the Greek story of Theseus, who actually fought the Minotaur in the labyrinth, the legend of this creature has long prevailed and is seen in many stories still today, including Dungeons and Dragons. And some would even argue that the beast in Beauty and the Beast is a creature modeled after the Minotaur. In our number one spot today, we have the satyr. We're not just talking about Mr. Tumnus, we're taking it all the way back to the Greek stories of the creature who is half man and half goat. These creatures started out in legends as a male nature spirit with ears and a tail resembling those of a horse, but throughout the years they became more human-like and less beast-like before they began to gain these more goat-like characteristics. It is thought that perhaps the depiction of the goat-human hybrid comes from them sort of melding with the character Pan. Either way, these creatures are often depicted as being comically hideous, and they also have quite a few lewd descriptions that I can't exactly detail here on YouTube. 
let's just say it is very obvious that they're always a little excited. This fits perfectly with the fact that these creatures are often known to love things like wine, music, dancing, and definitely women. Satyrs were companions to the god Dionysus and are believed to live in places like woodlands or the mountains or even in pastures. They are very motivated by sexual desires and are even known to do some pretty horrendous things in pursuit of these desires. Although these characters are quite ridiculous in a multitude of ways, they are also thought to possess a lot of really useful knowledge but they need to be persuaded into sharing it. How human. That's the most human-like characteristic that these guys have.